a warm good evening to all i thank orihe life sciences and iva for giving this platform to give a webinar series on basics of ophthalmology this series consists of module 1 module 2 and module 3 and the module 1 consists of review of clinical eye anatomy physiology errors of refraction and familiarity with diagnostic equipment so having said this i am actually very happy that many of you have joined on virtual mode to listen to ophthalmology and of late now surgical clinical practices are going up because of the demands that is coming up from the client side as well as from the uh, doctor side so we have good organizations also to bridge the gap ophthalmology is actually was my passion and which we started some 25 years before in our um, university and we have tried to standardize many surgical procedures with the help of um, postgraduate students uh, while doing their research work we were concentrating to standardize surgical methods in par with the human ophthalmology and uh, so having said this uh, looking back to anatomy so clinical eye anatomy is very important and for a practitioner to study ophthalmology is a always i used to tell students it is a self learning process and you have to spend more time you should have patience uh, to know the normals first and then the uh, variations in the normal scene and then the pathology so this is a mostly a kind of self study so eye anatomy when you have studied as a, in a bbsc curriculum you have studied it just anatomy alone but now you have a knowledge on pathology so we will try to look into all these aspects by um, forming a reverse engineering model type so now we will see what is actually related to in the clinical setting the importance of a anatomy of the eye okay so welcome you all we will go to the topics the small animal ocular anatomy and physiology so what we are going to do is we will study the eyeball as well as the adnexa the adnexal structures are very important which actually supports the eyeball and it consists of orbit the muscles glands and fat and eyelids etc and then comes the actual eyeball so we will study the anatomy of the eyeball from dimensions and all the layers starting from outside to inside so uh, that is how we study like the transparency of the organ is also exploited in such cases where you study from precorneal tear film down to conjunctiva then the the sclera uh, then the lens vitreous body retina etc then there are some spaces also inside the eye so these all these spaces are also very important we will go through that and basics on physiology so physiology basically um, actually um, uh, rear tear production and drainage and ocular barriers then aqueous humor and iop so all this we will study under physiology then little about refraction though refraction is not a very big concern in animals but still you should know the uh, physics of refraction little and then comes the field of vision color vision etc and how to diagnose with some basic ophthalmic instruments equipments so this familiarity you should have with the basic ophthalmic uh, diagnostic equipment so that also we will go through and you should also know that advanced imaging techniques are also there apart from this okay so now we will see the adnexa so the eyeball actually it develops from the forebrain or prosencephalon that's how the embryology in fact this is the first organ to start uh, formation from the brain and it commences at the gestation day 15 and gets completed by day 45 the materials for the eyeball comes from the optic nerve and the retina from the forebrain then the lens we actually it comes from the lens placard so that is arises from the surface ectoderm of the head and all the accessory tunics they arise from the adjacent mesenchyme 
So now this is a schematic diagram of the eye where you have different structures. And we will try to see all these structures with the relevant to clinical importance. So in this schematic diagram, you are able to see from the cornea. So it's a cross-section diagrammatic representation rather. And you can see the chamber that even the, the thickness of the cornea also you can appreciate in this. And then the chamber, then followed by the iris. Then you have the space, the anterior chamber, then the lens suspended with the zonules, and then the vitreous chamber, optic disc, and the optic nerve. So this is how the optic nerve gets connected to the, that's the second cranial nerve, which is the main sensory nerve for the vision. And it, it gets connected to the uh, lateral geniculate body of the cerebrum. This is a diagram of a, a dissection to show the main relationship between the brain and the eye. So you can see the various structures here. That is the optic nerve. This is the optic nerve and that cross each other. That is the optic chiasma. And below the optic chiasma, you can see the pituitary. And this is the olfactory nerve. And then this is the optic chiasm. Then the second, this is the pyriform lobe, and this is the pons, the medulla, etc. And this is the cerebellum. Now we will see the adnexal structures. So in a vertebrate eye, the periocular structures, so they are, they are called adnexal structures, which supports and give protection to the globe. And this is the first thing you should ex do a good examination in an ocular exam. So it starts with the orbit, that is the skull. So in the skull, you have the bony orbit. So I always say the bony orbit is incomplete and in the life, it is completed by the orbital ligament. So let me take the laser, yeah. So here you can see the here that in life, it will be filled with the orbital ligament. And this is how the eyeball will be placed inside the orbit. So this is the, here you can see along with the other attachments, the muscles, fascia, etc. So in a case of a dolichocephalic breed, this is how the eyeball will be placed because it is a little deep orbit. But in a brachycephalic breed, the, it will have a shallow orbit. And hence, the, you, if, here if you can see the eyeball here, there will be little more protrusion. When the orbit is shallow, the seating will be protruded more towards the outside. So that is why you have a protruded eyeball in case of brachycephalic brain. Then apart from this orbit, you also have ocular muscles that supports the eyeball and also it helps in the ocular motility. Then you have glands, lacrimal glands, the main gland, about 70% of the tear secretion is produced by the lacrimal gland and you have various ducts here small ductules so that opens into the superior fornix then this is very specific in case of dogs that is the zygomatic salivary gland and its position is on the ventral aspect of the lower eyelid then all these structures are again i said connected to the brain through the optic nerve so this optic nerve is again protected with the muscles. So the, all these muscles will form a cone-shaped structure and within the cone-shaped structure you will find the optic nerve. And again this optic nerve will be covered by the retrobulbar fat. So that actually gives a cushion effect. And what happens sometimes when there is trauma, we said that there can be sometimes proptosis of the eyeball. Apart from the proptosis, sometimes very rarely we find in animals herniation of the retrobulbar fat. So if you find some swelling subsequent to trauma on the below the eyelid, but on the conjunctiva, on the especially on the palpebral conjunctiva, if you find some swelling, that could be related to herniation of the fat. Then you have the eyelids, which mainly to protect the eye from outside. So these are the ocular muscles. Basically, we have studied uh, in the class, maybe uh, invariably 
would have studied even in the biology classes that they have, there are four straight muscles. So one is the dorsal rectus or the superior rectus, then the ventral or the inferior rectus, then you have the medial rectus and the lateral rectus. So the rectus muscles or straight muscles. So the main function is as per their terminology, it, it actually push the eyeball up. Here it comes ventrally, medially and laterally. Yet apart from this, there are also two oblique muscles that helps in the extorsion and intorsion. So you can see here the dorsal oblique muscle intorsion and the ventral oblique muscle results in extorsion. So that is how you find this extorsion and intorsion movement also in the eyeball. Now, to affect all these functions, the innervations also are very important. So the, the dorsal superior rectus muscle alone is supplied by the fourth trochlear nerve and the lateral rectus and the retractor bulbi muscle. So there is a muscle behind also, which is very characteristic of animals. It is not present in human beings. So that is why the animals are able to retract the eyeball back into the socket. So this is, of, of course, it is a, a defense mechanism. And the nerve supply for these two muscles are by the abducens nerve, that the cranial nerve 6. So that the main function is to retract the globe and also lateral deviation of the globe. So these two functions are affected by the cranial nerve 6. These are all, the nerve supply is important. Generally, you will be able to do a good neuro exam. In the, in the neuro exam, you will be studying the effect of all these nerves in all the reflexes. You will do various reflex tests and you will be trying to uh, put it in writing in your format, the intactness of the each cranial nerve. So that is the importance of the retractor ocular muscle. start from the eyelids. So the eyelids are basically the forms the palpebral fissure. The opening is called palpebral fissure. So this is not a properly formed eyelid that you can very well say from its shape. It is almost like a diagonal shape because the lower eyelid there is a dip. So that is called the extropion of the lower eyelid. So what happens when there is a deformity like this? There is a tear well. The tears are kept in the eye that always helps in the moistening or lubrication of the cornea. So this is what happens. It is It won't be kept in, in its proper shape. So there will be overflowing of this tear and that results in improper lubrication of the um, cornea as well as nutrition. So the nutrition also will be affected. So slowly you will get to see some pathologies on the cornea. And during the examination of the eye, so what you should do is you should do the... Uh, examination with the help of a magnification. So you can always use the condensing lens that is provided in the ophthalmoscopes to do this mag magnification and examination. Now the eyelids consist of, all of you know that it is a very thin pliable skin. So it's a very pliable skin. When you will notice that it is a pliable skin, when you, if you want to
create any abrasions when you do a shaving on the eyelid. Then followed by the connective tissue, which is modified sweat glands. Then muscles are there, followed that is basically the orbicularis oculi muscles, then the palpebral conjunctiva with the goblet cells. This is a cross section of the eyelid. You can see here the you can see the cilia here on the outside, and inside you can see the tarsal glands. And the tarsal glands actually you will find openings of these tarsal glands also on the middle of the eyelid. So that is why that actually appears. So these orifices forms a gray line in the um, eyelid margin, and this gray line should be avoided whenever you do take some sutures on the eye to correct, uh, if, for example, lacerations, if you want to do a correction, you should be very careful not to include this gray line in the bite area. So this is the normal cilia you, you are able to see here. These are all additionals. This is a second row of cilia if you find in the eye. So that is called dystychia. And these are all very small ectopic cilia. You will never see cilia here, so additional cilia. So what happens when you have additional ectopic cilia or dystychia, it results in, it will touch the cornea. This is the cornea. It touches, this is the conjunctival sac, and it touches the cornea frequently during every eyeball palpebral movement, and that, that will cause some irritations on the cornea. And then uh, persistent corneal irritations can cause even ulcers. So that is why examination of a, with a magnification, you will be able to, rule out the presence of dystychia or ectopic cilia. Yes, so this is an example, classical example of a lacerated wound. You can see there is a laceration here on the lower eyelid and also little towards the lateral canthus. This is the lateral canthus and this is the medial canthus and the eyeball is protected, still protected. That's what I should say. Even after this injury, the eyeball is very safe and you have some injuries on the lacerations on the top also. So, uh, so the reconstruction of such an eyelid is a very, uh, very big uh, challenge in the sense you should keep the, as I said in the earlier slide, the tear well should be formed completely well after the uh, correction of the um, eyelid suturing. So here, when you handle also, you are not supposed to handle with your instruments frequently. So you should have a very clear cut idea after thorough shaving and preparation of the site, where to hold, because frequent handling will result in edema of that or swelling. So when there is a swelling, your approximation of the sutures will, will not be proper and there won't be any good cosmetic effect. So after the eyelid, this is the corneal epithelium. So you can see the corneal epithelium here. And above the corneal epithelium, you have a fluid. So that is a tear fluid, PTF. We normally call it precorneal tear film. So the precorneal tear film is consists of mucin layer. Innermost is the mucin layer. Then you have the aqueous layer, watery layer, and then the lipid layer. So the function of the mucus layer is to keep the aqueous layer in contact with the epithelial cells. And this is done with the help of anchored glycoprotein as well as microvilli on the epithelium. And the evaporation of this aqueous layer is prevented by the lipid layer. So the lipid layer is secreted by the meibobian glands, the aqueous layer by the lacrimal gland and nictitans gland, and the mucin layer by the goblet cells. This PTF also helps to maintain the good corneal clarity. That is very important. It also helps to nourish the corneal epithelium and also protection wise also you have immunoglobulins enzymes it has got growth factors antibacterial effect and also fibronectin is also present so that will give a good smooth effect for the corneal epithelium so any alterations in this can cause a discomfort and it, in case of human beings they say any discomfort here because that is the first refracting surface when the light enters into the eye First refracting surface is this. So if any alteration in this can also cause errors in refraction and there will be the visual acuity will be affected. So for this normal tear film to uh, for a distribution of this, 
you should have a good normal anatomy of the ocular surface. So that is why adnexal anatomy is very important again. Then comes the conjunctiva. So you have a conjunctival layer basically formed of mucous membrane that covers the eyeball. It also covers the eyelid. It also covers the third eyelid. This is the third eyelid and this is the third eyelid margin. And another advantage of this is it is very highly vascular. When you say that cornea is vascular, this is a structure that is highly vascular. So what we normally do whenever there is an ulcer on the cornea, we try to utilize this vascularity of this tissue so that we will try to take a graft and then try to heal the corneal ulcer with the help of this uh, vascularized structure. So because of its highly vascular, delicate and mobile structure, it is very highly mobile also. That is why you can take the uh, graft from the uh, conjunctiva. So normally the dorsal conjunctival um, fornix is deeper when compared to the ventral conjunctival fornix. Fornix is the that space. So actually the reflection goes like this and it ends up and then comes down. So that space is called the fornix. And usually in dogs, the upper eyelid would be more mobile when compared to the lower eyelid. So also the fornix is more deeper for the upper when compared to the lower. This is a cross section of the medial eyelids and anterior globe. So this is mainly to demonstrate again the, the palpebral conjunctiva, then the bulbar conjunctiva. It ends at the level of the, what is this area? This is the limbus and the dorsal fornix. So here you can see this is the dorsal fornix. This area is the dorsal fornix. So I can show you like this. So this is the dorsal fornix. This area is the dorsal fornix. And here you can see the dorsal, the ventral fornix. The ventral fornix is divided. This is also ventral fornix. So the ventral fornix is divided by the nictitans third eyelid membrane. And the third eyelid is kept in place with the help of a cartilage called the T cartilage of the third eyelid. So ventral fornix is divided into two portions, whereas the dorsal fornix is not divided. You don't have any. It is deep also at the same time. And you have numerous goblet cells in the dorsal fornix. Then comes the third eyelid. So third eyelid is again a semi-rigid rough and a roughly triangular structure. And you have a good, uh, this free margin of the third eyelid always you should look, examine. And that actually helps in the actual wiper movement as you see in the car. So for the lubrication of the um, tear film over the cornea. And this T-shaped cartilage inside is a hyaline cartilage. And this uh, uh, around the T cartilage, you will find semi-mucoid lacrimal gland. So this lacrimal gland, that is nothing but the uh, nictitans gland. And this nictitans gland is actually attached very poorly because the connective tissue attachments are very poorly defined. And because of this inadequacy of these attachments, usually you will get proptosis of the nictitans gland. And this is also very common in few breeds of dogs. You should be knowing that. And the nictitans gland actually secretes about 25 to 40 percentage of the total tear production. So the main advantage of the third eyelid is, the, which is not present, which is very vestigial in case of human beings, is the protection of the cornea. So when what happens when there is, we have, I have told you that there is a retractor oculi muscle so the eyeball will be retracted back during this process. What happens? The, there will be extrusion of the third eyelid more towards the cornea. So And also it helps in the movement of the tears uh, down into the, uh, you have a upper punctum and a lower punctum. So movement of the tears down the punctum also can be, is mainly due to the presence of the third eyelid. So third eyelid being such a very important organ, you know, the removal of the third eyelid also you should think twice and it is indicated only when there is a tumor of the third eyelid otherwise always try to preserve the third eyelid the lacrimal gland which i said it is on it occupies a superior lateral position and you will find the ductules opening in the superior fornix and the tears produced from the lacrimal gland actually it goes on to the surface of the cornea and then it exits through the nasolacrimal duct. 
and there are two openings on the nasolacrimal duct that is the superior puncta and the inferior puncta then it is connected by the canaliculi and you will have a, you have a small sac here and then from the sac it is connected to the it runs through the pre sphenoid bone and it enters into the nasal ostium and here at the junction of the medial canthus you have a small projection with the, some cilia that is called the lacrimal carangle so fine hairs are there on these areas actually whenever you try to because this is a very watery area so when you try to put a, a um, sticky drape during surgery what happens is that you will not find a good adherence here because of this wetness and you will also find sometimes this small area peeping out into the surgical site or maybe normally it actually disturbs your um, surgical procedure so always try to take care that you include all this area within the drape when you put do it mainly when you do an intraocular surgery So now comes the cornea, which is the most transparent avascular anterior structure of the fibrous port, and it actually forms around uh, two by six of the cornea, and outer to inside the corneal layers include the first the uh, physiological layer that is the tear film, then the anatomical layers starts from the corneal epithelium, followed by the corneal stroma, then you have the endothelium. And in between the endothelium and the stroma, you have a tough membrane, Desmet's membrane. So, in fact, Desmet's membrane protects any injury that happens on the cornea. So, you will not find much tear here. Uh, this will actually protect the cornea injury entering into the anterior chamber. There is one more layer here between the corneal epithelium and the stroma, which is very poorly defined in breeds of uh, dogs. Uh, that is the Bowman's layer. So that is why we have studied A, B, C, D, E. So that B will be more normally missing in the uh, dog's cornea. And cornea is transparent because the stroma is in a relatively dehydrated state. Cornea is transparent because there is no pigmentation. Cornea is again transparent because there is no vascularity. So all these are very important. Whenever there is infection, you will lose, there will be pigmentation will start. In case of chronic inflammation, there will be vascularization as well as when the wound heals or whenever there is a defect in the endothelial pump, there will be enter of entry of the fluid into the stroma and there will be opacity. So that is when you find the visual deficit. Whenever the cornea is affected, you will find immediately a visual deficit because of the hydration status of the corneal stroma. So in a normal cornea, the corneal stroma is in a relatively dehydrated state. Now in this, this eyeball dissection, you can see how the cornea is, how thick the cornea is. I am trying to reflect the cornea. I have injected some viscoelastic into the chamber. So that is why you are able to see a formed anterior chamber or formed eyeball. And now I am trying to reflect the 
the vascular structure, the anterior most vascular structure, that is the iris. And you can, I will just try to reflect the other side also, so that you can see the junction between the iris and the lens. So this cornea is, see here you can see this cornea is very thick. So this is the, this, this is the thickness of the cornea. So you have the anterior epithelium, very thin layer. So, and the major share is by the stroma layer. So this is a stroma from here to here. You can see the stroma. Then you have a small desmans membrane and then the endothelium. So the main function of the cornea is it actually helps in the permeation of the oxygen. And this oxygen supply is mainly from the tear production as well as from the anterior chamber, aqueous humor. And peripheral cornea is also again oxygenated peripheral cornea, that is the area near the limbus. So this also that area is called the limbus cornea. So here you have blood supply from the limbus, vascular uh, capillary plexus. So you have little uh, nutrition happens here through the limbal plexus also, capillary plexus. And we said again that this, there is it is in a relatively dehydrated state. So this is again maintained by the uh, potassium sodium pump. The arrangement of the collagen fibers within the corneal stroma is also very important and it is actually arranged in a proper way and that is why the cornea is transparent. That is also another reason. Whereas in case of sclera, the collagens are not arranged in a proper arrangement. So that is why you find an op opaque nature here on the uh, sclera. And the same thing happens whenever there is a corneal scarring, the arrangement of these collagen fibrils will be altered and that results in the uh, scarring or corneal opacity or sometimes we, if it is very mild, we say as corneal haziness, etc. So this in this picture, I just want, uh, wanted to tell you that this is a very sharp instrument. This is a very sharp instrument. And with the help of this, we are trying to enter into the eye because the cornea is a tough structure. It is not a very soft structure. It is a really, relatively a tough structure. And that is why we always say a, we enter into the cornea not by incision. It is a stab wound. So to produce a stab wound, you need a keratoms like this or PP blades like number 11 blade can be used to produce a stab wound. And the cornea is transparent here. That is why you are able to see a defective iris. Is This iris is not normal in color. In case of Siberian husky, this iris is depigmented, heterochroma iridis. But this is not a pathology. It is only a normal variations in the anatomy. It is not at all a pathology. Here also you can see some cornea, mild opacity of the cornea. And this is not a dog's picture. It is a uh, horse picture where I just wanted to show you some irregular things you can see here on the iris on the top. So this is very important in case of horses where it acts as a windshield. Uh, it helps in the prevention of the rays directly falling onto the retina. They are called corpora nigra. Now the healthy cornea, its uh, clarity is maintained basically because of the various properties of the superficial layers. And all this, once the endothelium is affected, you will find a generalized corneal haziness to opacity like this. We normally grade the corneal opacity as uh, zero when it is transparent, plus one, plus two, plus three, and plus four. Plus four is maximum opacity where you will not be able to see the, any of the interior of the structure. So this corneal opacity, we normally grade it as plus two, where you can see a little of the iris as well as little of the fundic reflection. Now comes the sclera. Sclera is a very thick structure and it forms about five or six of the uh, fibrous coat. And the various straight muscles are attached or inserted onto the sclera. And it is composed of the episclera, scleral stroma, and the lamina fusca. So the episclera and the scleral stroma are important because we, whenever we do some surgeries on the sclera, we normally do surgeries for a glaucoma, the filtration surgeries, as well as to give some blocks, that is subtenance block. So we try to work over these areas. So you have to know what is this episclera, 
what is a scleral stroma. So when you start putting an incision here, episclera is a very highly vascular structure and which lies below the bulbar conjunctiva and it actually bends along with the another layer that is called the tenons capsule. So this tenons capsule is again a small membrane-like structure and you have to dissect that also to reach the actual scleral stroma. So we normally put an incision on the scleral stroma and try to take some uh, flaps on that area to put a gonio implant. Lamina fusca doesn't carry any surgical importance. It is a zone of pigmentation transition between the sclera and the choroid and the ciliary body. So the anterior most structure of the uvea, so you have the fibrous coat, then the vascular coat. Fibrous coat consists of sclera and cornea that we have finished. Coming to the vascular coat, you have the anterior uvea consists of iris and ciliary body and the posterior is mainly by the choroid. So the iris actually results in a pupillary opening and this is mainly mediated by the innervations are there for the iris or for the pupil. And whenever there is a full thickness corneal wound, it actually the iris comes in place. So I said, Normally, the desmoids membrane will not give any way, but if it happens, the iris will take up that place and it will try to seal the tissue, uh, seal the corneal wound. And always you should check the uh, such when the case is present. You should see that the whether the iris tissue is viable or not. If it is not viable, it can be excised. And any surgical manipulations on the iris results in hemorrhage and that will also result in uh, postoperatively also you will find some bleeding. So you should all, as far as possible, you should try to avoid handling iris whenever you do any intraocular surgeries. So the iris actually results in a pupillary opening and this pupillary opening constricts that cause, causes causing meiosis towards light. When you shine light into the eye, there will be meiosis. Also, due to some parasympathetic agents, when you put, there will be meiosis. And a meiotic eye also tells you that there is pain. So whenever there is mild inflammation inside the anterior chamber, inflammatory mediators like prostaglandins will be secreted. And that is again due to pain. And this prostaglandins cause eye. You should be you should be very anxious because there will be pain inside and you should treat accordingly with some anti-inflammatory agents and the handling of the eye also should be you should be careful even if a dog is very friendly dog if there is a pain in the eye when you start handling it will try to bite so all these things will give you a clue and sometimes you will also see some changes in the iris color uh, they're like heterochroma iridis as we saw in the few slides earlier. So when you when we talk about um, iris um, and the ciliary body, we said it is anterior and the choroid is the ciliar. And inflammation of this iris and ciliary body called uh, results in anterior uveitis. And inflammation of the choroid results in posterior uveitis. Anterior uveitis you can treat with uh, topical preparations, whereas Posterior uveitis, you have to go for systemic eye drops, systemic medications. Now, from the iris, and that is again from the ciliary body, the formation of the acus humor starts and it enters into the first into the posterior chamber, then through the pupil, it enters into the anterior chamber and exit through the corneoscleral, trabecular meshwork, and uveoscleral pathway. In this, you should know the percentage that is very important. So the actus humor that is secreted by the ciliary body gets drained through the corneoscleral trabecular meshwork about 90% and about only 10 to 15% through the uveoscleral pathways. There are drugs when you treat glaucoma to improve the drainage through the uveoscleral pathways, but it is only it is going to help only some 10 to 15%. So that is why surgical drainage or filtrations 
if you do at the corneoscleral trabecular area, you will get a good improvement for a in the treatment of a glaucoma patient. So the iris and the ciliary body, mainly the anterior uvea, and whenever there is inflammation of the anterior uvea, that results in reduced IOP. So that is mainly because whenever inflammation of the ciliary body happens, the secretion of the aqueous humor also will be reduced, and that results in lowered IOP. So in, an, in a patient, when you get a lowered IOP, you, that tells you that there is some anterior uveitis that is going on in the patient. So the main uh, function of the aqueous humor is to provide nutrients and also it removes waste products for the lens, anterior vitreous, iris and posterior cornea, that is the endothelial area. Here you can see some normal variations, that is the tetrachroma iridis, the whole iris is depigmented. Here you can see a partial pigmentation of the area, but these areas are not pigmented. Now comes the lens. So lens is a very biconvex structure, very transparent structure. And you can, I just kept the lens on a piece of a paper. So here you can see the magnification that is created by the lens. And this lens is actually a, arises from the surface ectoderm in its embryological life. And it is again not uh, vascularized. There is no pigmentation. That is why it is transparent. And it is kept in place with the help of the zonular ligaments. So the shape of the lens can be altered with the help of the zonular ligaments. When it contracts and relaxes, the shape will be altered and accordingly the image will be fall on the on retina. So in the embryonic life, actually you will see the, the middle part is the embryonic life and the fetal, then the adult and the cortex, etc. So here in this video, you can see this is a, eyeball, a lens which I have removed from an eyeball fixed in a Davidson's medium. So you can see the presence of the uh, presence of the uh, white structure that is on the cornea, on the uh, on the lens. So that it appears that it has, there is a cataract. Now the lens is actually behind the iris. So this picture will tell you, the video will tell you that. So behind the iris, when, the, when you pharmacologically dilate the eye like this, then only you will be able to see the lens. And then only you will, be, if the lens is transparent, you will be able to see the fundus. This is, of course, a human cornea, that is a human fundus. That is why you are able to see the optic disc along with another structure. What is this structure? This is very important in case of... Um, human beings, especially with the diabetes and all, this is a structure they will look into. Any ophthalmologist will try to look this structure that is called the macula. And also age-related macular maculopathy is also very common in case of human beings. And diabetic macular degeneration is also very common. So this, instead of, this is an area where you have maximum roads and cones in the retina. Whereas in case of optic disc, there is no roads and cones. So here, this is the maximum area of macula is the area where you will have maximum vision because of the presence of the high density of roads and cones. In animals, you do not have this macular region. Instead, you have a area centralis. So area centralis is the region where you have maximum area of, and the cones, cone population is less. So you have maximum roads in that area in dogs. So, so the structure is behind the iris. So uh, in front of this area is called the anterior chamber and this is the posterior chamber. So the lens is behind the iris that is in the posterior chamber. Here you can see a dilated eye, completely dilated eye. You can see the periphery of the iris only. And you can see the lens in the center position like this. In the next, you will see here. So if the lens is occupying this area, you will not see the back of the eye. Okay? So the, you can dilate the eye and then you can see the complete, uh, not the central part of the nuclear or the nuclear part of the lens alone. You will be able to see the complete lens. And then after seeing this only, you will be able to study the actual uh, visual deficit that is uh, going to cause on the animal because of the opacity of the lens.
And in this lens, I don't know whether you are able to appreciate, there is a Y suture here. This is the, so that is the lens fibers are actually, these are all the lens fibers. So they, when they join together, they form a Y. And this is the anterior Y on the anterior side. And this is the posterior Y on the polar side. And this posterior polar Y is very important. When you actually do a cataract surgery, when you do FACO emulsification like this, you will be trying to dissect the or divide the nucleus of the lens into various parts uh, to remove it one by one. And in doing so, sometimes you will also see the posterior Y. So when you see the posterior Y, that means you are almost near the posterior capsule of the, uh, of the lens. So when the PC is very near to the FACO tip, you should be very careful. So you can reduce the FACO power and then proceed further to prevent a PC rupture. Now in this video also, you can see how the lens is, how deep the lens is and how, what is the attachment between the lens and the iris. So I'm trying to remove the lens. So this is how we normally we do in the case of an extra capsular cataract extraction. This is an extra capsular cataract extraction in a dissection model. Okay, no, this is not a surgery. So while doing a dissection, this is how you should learn. You can also see the transparent uh, blade underneath the lens. And the lens can be removed with the help of a lens scoop or a lens spoon in the surgical cell. So you are trying to so the canine lens is a, a really it is a very uh, voluminous lens. So when compared to the human lens, this is uh, almost double the human lens, and that is why you require more time to remove the lens, canine lens when you do a FACO surgery. And the lens in the normal clinical setting, you will sometimes see like this a mild opacity on the lens that is called the incipient cataract. If it is immature, this is how it will appear. In a mature lens, you will find a complete opacity. In a hyper mature lens, you will find some resorption of the opacity. So that is why, you, but the hyper mature lens normally will be presented with a dilated pupil. Behind the lens is the vitreous. So you can see here, the vitreous is actually a gel-like substance that actually gives a cushion effect. And in fact, this is the tertiary vitreous that you actually see in the embryological development. And the lens is placed within the uh, patellar fossa of the vitreous. And you have the behind of the lens, you have the lens, the posterior lens capsule. And on the, on the vitreous also, you have a membrane called the anterior hyaloid membrane. And between the anterior hyaloid membrane and the posterior capsule, there is a small space called the Burgers space. So all these things are very important when you actually do some surgeries on the uh, lens. So one of the main advantage of the or function of the vitreous is to give shape for the eye, of course. Whenever there is a dehydration in an animal, what happens? There will be sunken eyes, you would have observed. So the sunken eyes is mainly due to dehydration or reduced volume of the vitreous. And it also helps to maintain the intraocular pressure during contraction of the extraocular muscles. So that is also one big advantage. Vitreous body also carries importance in the forensic medicine uh, based upon the vitamin C content of the vitreous, uh, which is more in case of young patients and in case of adult patients, the vitamin C content is little less. So that is also some difference you will see in the, uh, in the composition of the vitreous. There is one major difference in the vitreous between the human and the uh, um, dog vitreous or the canine vitreous is the vitreous is actually formed uh, in the center and also there is an outer vitreous in the, in the gel. So the outer vitreous is more hard when compared to the central vitreous in human side, whereas in the dog, the central vitreous is uh, more hard, whereas the outer vitreous is thinner. 
so that is why uh, especially in case of uh, small toy breeds what happens whenever when the dog tries to jump from a reasonable height that itself can result in detachment of the vitreous so that means to tell you that the vitreous has got also an important role to play in the attachment of the retina towards the choroid excuse me now comes a pigmented part of the posterior part so when you look into the animal's eye in fact many you will ask what is that shining structure this shine is mainly due to the presence of the zinc and riboflavin and they are highly organized arrangement of cells you will find in the choroid so tapetum is a portion of the choroid not a portion of the retina not a portion of the sclera so you will find it the tapetum behind the retina so you should uh, understand that anatomy very clearly because whenever there is a defect in the retina for example whenever there is a thinning of the retina you will find hyper reflectivity of the tapetum whereas when a, in case of a inflammation of the retina when it is thick the reflection will be less so that is one clue and also the tapetum of an immature dog will be very blue in color and uh, so as the maturation starts the uh, color also differs and the tapetum actually occupies the upper one hemisphere of the fundus so fundus is a structure which you will not study in the anatomy it is an image you find in the um, ophthalmoscope now in this video you can see the the increase is also, also removed and you can directly see the little part of the vitreous is there plus the tapetum you can also see the vasculatures behind the tapetum where these vessels are on the retina <laughs>